नमस्कार सुस्वागतम केम छो आदाबार्स गुड आफ्टरनून आप सभी का पी आर एल कैमरेज व्याख्यान में स्वागत है अभिनंदन है ए वेरी वॉम वेलकम फ्रॉम मी अनिल भारद्वाज फॉर द पी आर एल का अमृत व्याख्यान टूडे इज द सिक्सटी सिक्स व्याख्यान ऑफ द सेवेंटी फाइव एपिसोड सीरीज ऑफ व्याख्यान विच इज बींग ऑर्गेनाइज एज अ पार्ट ऑफ पी आर एल सेवेंटी फाइव ईयर्स ऑफ लेगेसी एंड हिस्ट्री इन फंडामेंटल फिजिक्स एंड स्पेस साइंसेस इस्टेब्लिश इन द ईयर नाइनटीन फोर्टी सेवन बाई द फादर ऑफ इंडियन विक्रम सारा भाई The PRL's platinum jubilee coincides with India's 75 years of independence. Hence, it's a joint celebration of the development of science and technology in India by PRL under the banner of PRL ka Amrit Vyakhan. Today, we have yet another very distinguished Vyakhan karta, Justice Vikram Nath, who is the judge of the Supreme Court of India in New Delhi, and he is going to talk. on a very illuminating title uh, technology and science in legal relief we greatly appreciate and thank justice vikram nath for agreeing to join us on prl kamrit vyakhyan today which is a part of prl's pratyam jubilee celebration as well as azadi kamrit mohs i now request my colleague professor nandita shivastav to kindly and formally introduce our vyakhyan karta to the audience at the webex planner as well as those who have joined us live on the prls youtube channel over to you professor nandita thank you professor bharadwaj it is my special honor and privilege to introduce today's speaker the honorable judge of the supreme court of india justice vikram nath uh, being from prl I am sure that most of us are aware that prior to his elevation to the Supreme Court of India, he served as the Chief Justice of the High Court of Gujarat. Honorable Justice Vikram Nath received his bachelor's degree degrees in science from Allahabad University and in law from Shia PG College of Lucknow University. I would like to point out that he is a proud fourth-generation lawyer from his family in Allahabad. He started his legal career in 1987 as a lawyer at the Allahabad High Court where he was elevated as additional judge in September 2004. He became a permanent judge of the Allahabad High Court in February 2006 and held the office of the senior judge of the Allahabad High Court from 2017 to 2019. Justice Vikram Nath has edited several legal volumes including development of law consisting of landmark judgments of Allahabad High Court and Gavel and Pen volumes 1 and 2. He was also the chief editor of two volume publications of the Allahabad High Court newsletters and also its centenary volume reprints in 2017-18. In spite of his busy schedule as a judge of the Supreme Court of India, Justice Vikram Nath finds for time for additional responsibilities. He is a joint secretary of the Allahabad University Alumni Association and honorary secretary of the Old Boys Association St Joseph's College Allahabad. He also loves to play badminton regularly among other hobbies he has a keen interest in poetry and urdu shayari during his tenure as the chief justice the high court of gujarat became the first high court in india to live stream its proceedings on youtube i hope that in his talk he will touch upon his thoughts on that led to this seminal step towards bringing transparency in legal proceedings We are indeed very thankful to Honorable Justice Vikram Nath for accepting our invitation to deliver the Vyakhyan on technology and science in legal realm. In fact, when I first approached him with this request, he told me that he is not used to giving lectures, but his main job is to listen. I am happy that, in spite of being a patient listener as a judge, he has agreed to speak to us on a topic that is of relevance to space technologists and scientists. although we are aware that the this is not a topic that he deals on a regular basis without much further ado i now invite honorable justice vikram nath to deliver the 66th vyakhyan on technology and science in legal realm justice vikram nath please namaskar indeed it's a proud privilege and honor for me to be invited as a guest speaker on this amrit uh, mahotsav which uh, the 
physical research laboratory is celebrating along with the 75th birthday of our country after independence as the PRL itself was established in 1947. Initially, Professor Shavastav is right when she requested me that uh, I should be one of the speakers. I was very hesitant and uh, rightly so because for the last now 18, 19 years, I have been only listening and not speaking much. Earlier, of course, I was speaking and uh, addressing quotes and getting orders for my clients, trying to get them justice. But nevertheless, uh, considering the audience and uh, the liberty given to me to choose a topic of my choice, I thought, let me make an endeavor and uh, share some thing inter interlinked with law and science in my today's delivery. I was in Gujarat for two years as Chief Justice, but uh, suffered a lot of movement and all were restricted because of the impact of COVID-19, which hit soon after I joined in Gujarat. That was, I joined in September and six months later, the COVID was there and everything was paralyzed. So couldn't even get in touch with Professor Shrivastava or roam around and, you know, visit PRL and meet all of you. But now that I am in Delhi and I am getting this opportunity, I thought that maybe I could have visited the PRL in Ahmedabad. If you invite me ever, I will come and I always love to come to Ahmedabad and meet my, you know, colleagues there and of course, all of you. So some other time, if there is a physical, uh, you know, presentation or a seminar or a lecture or anything, I will definitely come. But this is virtual is a better thing in the sense that nobody has to travel I'm sitting at home. I can make my delivery and everyone can hear it. So I, first of all, let me also thank PRL for giving me this opportunity and uh, I wish PRL all the best and all its team and scientists. I could uh, gather from the, you know, the, your booklet and your information available, the achievements made by PRL over a period of time, right from 1947, the establishment of your uh, 1.2 M Mount Abu telescope, the Udaipur Solar Observatory, and uh, then the you know discovery of the helium nova, the exoplanets, and other achievements, which of course you've been continuing, like the measurement of the most accurate hard X-ray polarization of Crab Nebula. I don't understand all these technical terms, but then these are all achievements of PRL. I congratulate all of you. And I hope and trust that PRL will be making an endeavor to making much more discoveries and getting much more, you know, accomplishments and uh, laurels all over the world and fulfill the dream of its founder, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. So switching over to my delivery. The topic of my today's address is technology and science in legal, legal realm. India's journey in enhancing robust space research and space exploration program has much to do with the honest efforts of several scientists working in various institutions similar to this one in post-independent India. A space technology endeavor in a nascent country with a handful of resource seems like a job that is near to impossible. It seems like an appropriate time to reminisce about the works of the founder of this very institution, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai and his allies, Jawaharlal Nehru and Homi J. Bhabha. The learned individuals had set the landscape for many Indians who are devoting their lives toward the cause of this nation in their own inimitable ways and research. Nehru professed, I quote, 
Science alone can solve the problems of hunger and poverty, insanitation and illiteracy, of superstition and deadening custom of, and traditions, of vast resources running to waste, of a rich country inhabited by starving people." Unquote. In 1958, that is within a year of the launch of Sputnik 1, the parliament passed a scientific policy resolution. Mr. Bhabha constituted the Indian National Committee for Space Research in Kospar with Sarabhai as its chairman and as they say, the rest is history. ISRO formed in 1969 superseded the erstwhile in Kospar. It was an articulate moment endowed by Mr. Sarabhai that a town going by the name of Thumba near Thiruvantapuram happened to have a treasure inexplicable to the people of the town. Little did the fisher folk realize that the sleepy village possessed a unique geophysical pearl felicitous to his need. Pumba lays close to the magnetic equator, a happenstance that Sarabhai was quick to exploit. It was a historic moment for this nation that on 21 November 1963, a sounding rocket took off from the shores of Thumba, ending its anonymity. Sarabhai was relatively clear about why India should pursue space. I quote, we must be second to none in the application of advanced technologies to the real problems of man and society which we find in our country." Unquote. He also emphasized that the progress achieved through the application of space technology must be measured in hard economic and social terms. On 11th November 1947, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai founded the Physical Research Laboratory and commenced research on cosmic rays and the properties of the upper atmosphere and shed light on the various truths about our universe that were not known to mankind. Ever since PRL has come a long way, be it the establishment of ozone station or setting up of a 1.2 M telescope at Mount Abu or Udaipur Solar Observatory with its multi-application solar telescope. It specializes in research in the areas of astronomy and astrophysics solar physics, space and atmospheric sciences, atomic molecular and optical physics, theoretical physics, geosciences and planetary sciences. My today's deliberation has five separate topics, which I would be discussing briefly. First is the space law in India, the second environmental laws and science, Third is the role of technology in India's judicial system. Fourth is data privacy law in India. And fifth, a brief note on artificial intelligence and law, the upcoming technology. Now coming to the first topic, space law in India. As voiced by the previous ISRO chairman, Mr. K. Sivan, I quote, a space act would help the government deal with legal issues arising from objects put up in space and for what happens to them in orbit or because of them." Unquote. The legal regime governing the space industry in India is determined by the Constitution of India, the Satellite Communications Policy 2000 and the revised Remote Sensing Data Policy 2011. Article 51 and Article 73 of the Constitution fosters respect for international law and treaty obligations in consonance with the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties 1968. In the aftermath of the Pathan Court attack of 2016, Geospatial Information Regulation Bill was introduced in the Parliament to regulate the spatial information on maps such as Google Maps and restrict mapping by private companies with licensing. The advent of commercialization thus calls for revising domestic laws such as the laws of contract, transfer of property, stamp duty, registration, insurance, and most importantly, intellectual property rights to contemplate space-related issues. To remedy the above situation, ISRO prepared a draft space activities bill in 2017 and kept it open for public comments. The bill was largely based on the model law on national space legislation drafted by the International Law Association for the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, OPUS. However, the draft bill has not been passed in the Parliament and hence has not been a binding law. 
The indemnity provision under Section 12 of the bill is a welcome step, but its requirement should also be reflected when the license is granted to an entity to engage in space activities. In other words, when a license is being granted to a private organization, it should have enough financial resources, insurance, backing to indemnify the government of India in case of any mishap. Further, Section 21, 25 refers to intellectual property rights and mandates that all IPR in space shall be protected under any law with the primary objective of safeguarding the national interest. It would make sense that the Indian IPR regime should apply to such bodies. Since the late 70s, scientists have opposed the thought that space could be exploited without any limits. Nowadays, unclaimed space debris seriously threatens the sustainable use of space as it has become a major hazard to navigational functioning satellites. The international framework for space law is not even in a position to effectively deal with the issue of space debris creation, mitigation, sustainable exploration and removal. Moreover, it is noted that space debris is not even mentioned in the Article 9 of the Treaty on Principles governing the activities of states in the exploration and use of outer space, including the Treaty of Moon and other celestial bodies, the Outer Space Treaty. The growing worldwide concern over space debris has reached the home turf too. India finds itself at the center of an international dispute over the fall of debris from an Indian satellite on a Japanese village, which was retracing back to Earth. As a signatory to the Convention on International Liability for Damage Caused by Space Objects, 1972, India has an absolute liability to pay compensation for damage caused by its space object on the surface of the Earth or to aircraft in flight. However, with no national space law and policy, it is tough for India to determine the quantum of damages owed. The Indian Space Policy 2022 In the current situation of increasing commercialization, a pure government function is to be revolutionized and so the policymakers deemed it necessary to have stipulated the Space Policy 22 as a change maker in the domain of space exploration. For the first time in the country, private entities also will now be able to own imaging satellites under the Space Policy 2022. This will help to create new avenues where earlier such imaging satellites were only owned by the ISRO and the Defence Ministry. The Indian National Space Promotion and Authorization Centre in SpaceE has been established to act as a promoter of space activities by the non-governmental and private entities along with New Space India Limited, the public sector undertaking of the department. In 2022, the space sector is witnessing what the information technology sector experienced in the 1990s. All these efforts are for the betterment of human livelihood as the programs performed by the satellites are urban planning, traffic management, or high precision agriculture. The data information and services collected through these imaging satellites will directly or indirectly contribute to achieving the sustainable development goals and to assess and monitor progress towards achieving goal nine, which encompasses industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Laws relating to space, be it the space activities or its aftermath, are in an evolving stage as of now and yet to be crystallized not only for India, but also worldwide. I now move on to the next chapter, which is environmental law. I start with a Slok from the Rigved Sang Rakshate Dushito Na Sya Loka Manav Jivanam Na Koopi Kasichida Nasham Uryabda Sasya Siddhaye. Translated into English, it means Do not pollute the world, may human life be safe. No one should harm anyone for the accomplishment of wealth. A scientific approach to environmental issues by the lawmakers helps us to identify environmental problems, their causes, and their possible solutions in an effective manner. Environmental laws in India are reflective of the constitutional provisions and India's international obligations. It strives to ensure the protection of the environment 
and actively promotes the sustainable use of natural resources. The Parliament over the years has enacted several comprehensive environmental legislations in furtherance of constitutional mandates and international obligations. These include the Wildlife Protection Act 1972, which provides for protection of wildlife with a view to ensure ecological and environmental security of the country. The Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974, enacted with the aim of preventing and controlling water pollution, maintaining or restoring of wholesomeness of water in the country. The Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1981, this act provides for prevention, control and abatement of air pollution. The Environment Protection Act 1986, this provides for the protection and environment of the improvement of the environment. The Energy Conservation Act 2001, it specifies the energy consumption standards for equipment and appliances. And it also prescribes energy consumption norms and standards for consumers. The Biological Diversity Act 2002 provides for the conservation of biological diversity, sustainable use of its components and fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising out of the use of biological resources and knowledge. The Scheduled Tribes and Other Traditional Forest Dwellers Recognition of Forest Rights Act 2006. This act recognizes and vests the forest rights and occupation in forest land, in forest dwelling, scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers. The National Green Tribunal Act 2010 provides for establishment of a National Green Tribunal for the effective and expeditious disposal of cases relating to environmental protection and conservation of forests and other natural resources. The constitutional provisions relating to environment, Article 48 of the A of the Constitution, which is the directive principle of the state policy, states that the state shall endeavor to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard the forest and wildlife of the country. The Constitution also places an accompanying duty on the Indian citizens in the form of Article 51 AG, protect and improve the natural environment including forests, lakes, rivers, and wildlife, and to have compassion for living creatures. Additionally, the Supreme Court over the years through public interest litigations has been steadfast in upholding environmental rights. In the case of rural litigation and entitlement claimed versus state, popularly known as the Dehradun Quarrying case, the Honorable Supreme Court directed to stop the excavation and illegal mining which were causing landslides in the ecologically sensitive Dune Valley. Valley over the decades. The Supreme Court has again reiterated through its judgment that the right to life includes the right to wholesome environment, thereby reminding us that our survival is directly linked to the survival of our environment. It has played a major role in inculcating a sense of awareness among the general public and all the stakeholders to the effect that a clean environment is essential for leading a dignified life. In the famous case of MC Mehta versus Union of India, delivered in 1987, the principle of absolute liability of a hazardous chemical manufacturer to give compensation to all those affected by an accident was introduced. It was the first time compensation was paid to the victims in such a case. In the case of Subhash Kumar versus the state of Bihar, 1991 judgment, the Supreme Court held the right to get pollution-free water and air is a fundamental right under Article 21. Thereby, the liberal interpretation of Article 21 by the Apex Court to include various environmental rights over time has given a way to protect the environment and balance the rights of the citizens vis-a-vis -vis the needs of industrial development. The violation of or pollution of environment is a criminal offence. The Indian Penal Code 1860 contains provisions for such offences and also provides for the punishment. Let me list out some of the few sections of the Indian Penal Code which deal with such offences. Section 268 
classifies environmental crimes as a public nuisance. A person is guilty of a public nuisance who does any act or is guilty of an illegal omission which causes any common injury, danger or annoyance to the public or to the people in general who dwell or occupy property in the vicinity or which must necessarily cause injury, obstruction, danger or annoyance to persons who may have occasion to use any public right. Section 290 penalizes the offense causing a public nuisance with a fine extending up to rupees 200. Thus, those who act or omit causing injury to others by environmental pollution, then they can be subjected to prosecution. In the case of K. Ramakrishna versus the state of Kerala, the Kerala High Court had held that smoking in public places causes public nuisance and is therefore punishable. Again, in Murli S. Devara versus Union of India in 2001, the Supreme Court held that under Article 21, smoking in a public place is a violation of the fundamental right of those who don't smoke. Section 277 is applied for preventing water pollution and imposes prison imprisonment for up to three months or a fine up to rupees 500 or both. The section uses terms such as public spring or reservoir, whose interpretation by the courts has been quite restrictive as it does not include running waters of rivers, streams, and canals. Section 278 provides a fine of up to rupees 500 imposed on anyone who voluntarily spoils the surrounding by making it harmful to anyone's health in general dwelling or carrying a business in the neighborhood or passing along the way of the public. Section 430 provides for punishment to anyone who commits mischief by doing any act which causes or which he knows to be likely to cause a diminution of the supply of water for agricultural purposes or for food or drink for human beings or for animals which are property or for cleanliness or for carrying on any manufacture shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to five years or with fine or with both. Now we move on to the next chapter of discussion, which is the technology, use of technology in judicial system. Before we start discussing the technological initiatives taken up by the FX Court, a rudimentary question needs to be addressed. Why is there a pressing need for intervention of technology in the conventional setup? The issues that we face with conventional setup and institutions are manifold primarily being the opaque nature of traditional institutions which hinder accessibility. It further accentuates pre-existing issues such as illiteracy amongst the Indian population and lack of awareness, which further paves the way for abuse of process and exploitation of the marginalized. In such scenario, I believe technology provides a plethora of feasible options for us to be able to bridge the gap in the process of administration of justice. All of us witness the complementary role between the use of technology and the administration of justice when the pandemic set in, bringing everything to a halt. Courts across the country raised against time to ensure that justice dispensation did not get hampered and to preserve the rule of law in the democracy as envisaged by the Constitution of India. The courts rose to the challenge and deployed technology to the fullest. Currently, the Supreme Court is working under a hybrid mode under which the arguing counsel and the parties are permitted to appear either physically or online as convenient for them. Therein, this ensures that the counsel of the parties do not miss out on their dates. For instance, while exercising the power under Article 142 of the Constitution to grant a decree of divorce to mutually consenting parties, the couples have in many cases appeared virtually after giving them an opportunity of being heard and upon being satisfied with their answers, the orders are passed. This also contributes to saving on the financial costs which the party might have to incur in order to just travel to the Supreme Court. A total of 1,18,891 hearings have been conducted by the Supreme Court. An order was passed by a five-judge bench giving legal sanctity to the orders and the court hearing done through video conferencing. Current initiatives by the E-Committee headed by Justice Chandrachud. The E-Committee of the Supreme Court was set up under the National Policy and Action Plan for Implementation of Information and Communication Technology. 
in the Indian Judiciary 2005. The core governing principles for the committee are harnessing technology to empower and enable. To say technology should not merely be about the automation of conventional practices and processes, but must be a vehicle for transformation, a force which empowers and enables all citizens. Second, the ensuring access to justice to all. The approach to the judicial institution should not be stopped, resisted by any digital divide or other socio-economic challenges. Third, creating an efficient and responsive judicial system. The use of technology enabling the judicial system not only to provide speedy justice, but also the evolution of efficiency metrics to monitor and map the judiciary's competencies and effectiveness. The E-Committee has taken several initiatives, which I list them now. National Judicial Data Grid to track pendency of cases. It is a database of orders, judgments, and case details of 18,735 computerized district and subordinate courts created on an online platform under the eCourse project. The data is updated on a near real-time basis by the connected district and taluka courts. It provides information relating to judicial proceedings, decisions of all computerized district and subordinate courts of the country. Case data is available on NJDG for both civil and criminal cases with the ability to perform drill down analysis based on the age of the case as well as the state and district. Virtual courts have been set up to deal with traffic violations through online adjudication. 21 virtual courts have been set up in 17 states as of September 2022 for the set purpose. As the lockdown was lifted, keeping in mind the efficacy and advantages of virtual courts, the Supreme Court, High Courts and District Courts have continued their functioning through video conference in a hybrid model. A justice clock has been set up in nearly all High Courts and District Courts with its e-version on the website to display disposal and pendency of cases. The most striking feature of this clock is its display of case clearance rate for the current date, last date, last week, last month, this year and last year. The case clearance rate maintains accountability on the part of the court by keeping it on its toes and enhances transparency, while to the public it reflects how efficiently the court has been doing its job, thereby strengthening the entire process. The e-court fee system has been introduced in most of the states across the country. Another big step which has been taken recently towards judicial transparency is live streaming of Supreme Court proceedings in constitution bench matters. Shortly, there are there is likelihood that the regular court proceedings would also be live streamed from the Supreme Court. One cannot overlook the fact that such live streaming is bound to open up a world of accountability on part of the judges who shall be under constant scrutiny. It reinforces the belief of people that every institution, be it the apex judicial institution of the country, is under ceaseless checks and balances. E-filing software for digital filing of cases, which eliminates the transmission and filing of physical copies. Interoperate operable criminal justice system for live electronic exchange of data between the police and judiciary, portal for electronic payment of fines, fees and deposits, judgment search portal with a free text search engine. Let me also briefly mention the future initiatives likely to come by the use of technology in the judiciary is guided by two facets, central to Gandhian thought, access and inclusion. In addition, the core values of trust, empathy, sustainability, and transparency provide the guardrails for achieving the founding vision. There are numerous other projects that are underway at the moment, such as creation of a single window system for processing all jail petitions of convicts and under trial prisoners, citizen service portal, e-parole windows, e mulakat record, e-custody certificates, etc. Draft vision document for phase three of e-court project has been prepared, which envisions digital courts that deliver justice as a service to all, beyond simply replicating offline processes digitally. 
these are just a few out of the long list of initiatives that the e committee of the supreme court is currently working upon let's also briefly discuss about the challenges ahead while we talk about the progress that we have made it becomes imperative for us to be cognizant of the challenges that lie in our way ahead implementing a new system is bound to give rise to suspicion apprehension and a lot of resistance as the stakeholders will always prefer to work with the conventional methods in such a situation change management allows one to assess the situation and answer why the change is needed and one can then align the efforts and resources accordingly allow me to share a bit of my own experience in this regard with the blessings of the almighty the constant efforts of my brother and sister judges and the wholehearted support of the ICT and e governance committee i was able to introduce a series of litigant friendly ICT initiatives at the gujarat high court during my tenure there to facilitate not only the litigants but also the lawyers to a large extent the first of these was video conferencing email filing and e filing in order to facilitate smooth joining of the to the video conferencing hearing sessions we also had to develop software based automation to send advance vc links through sms and email in integration with the published cause list instant sms call out facility was also developed for use by the court masters to issue sms alerts to the advocates for joining vc hearing sessions <clears throat> whenever a new technology is rolled out there are a string of other complementary changes that need to be introduced in order to facilitate a smooth transition process owing to a swift transition to virtual mode during the period the court functioned entirely through video conferencing the judicial work undertaken by the high court yielded a case clearance rate of 78% with disposal of 79093 matters against the institution of around a lack of matters these figures include a total of 22070 interim applications filed and 17135 disposed of if only main matters are considered the case clearance rate again comes to the same 78% which i deem to be a decently high ccr there was an online mentioning platform for facilitating seamless submission of requests for mentioning of matters an online mentioning platform was developed this meant that now an advocate or party in person registered for a particular matter could submit a mentioning request online upon sms ott verification vc links were sent instantly by the system to them for joining when the request is taken up by the concerned branch with gradual enhancements in the mentioning platform the advocates could submit mentioning requests also for matters listed on the day for adjournment or priority of hearing in the matter more than 46000 mentioning requests were received and processed by this platform during the pandemic period i believe you will be able to appreciate how uncomplicated the entire process was made via this platform if you see it in the light of the hassle the lawyers have to undergo to mention the matter in the physical proceedings another development that certainly deserves mention is the email notification update for the whole life cycle of the case email notifications for the listing of the matters and order judgment uploading were already being sent to all the advocates during the pandemic crisis due to the challenges faced in physical reach to the premises we laid special emphasis to share maximum case updates through email notifications accordingly automatic transmission of email notifications to the advocates and parties in person on events like filing registration scrutiny disposal uploading of orders and judgments and process issuance were developed and implemented even digitally signed bail orders were started to be automatically sent to all concerned subordinate court and the learned advocates when we say that justice should be more accessible unfortunate times like the pandemic did put it to test but that is when technology came to our rescue in countless ways some of which we had not even thought of before as the one above our vision was to provide a push to the email based services and that they should continue further another first of its kind initiative an alternate platform for instant information dissemination was introduced in the form of a new display board which is telecast live on the high court youtube channel 
and the telegram channel for sharing circulars, miscellaneous notifications, causes, etc. The official telegram channel of the High Court presently has more than 7,000 subscribers getting miscellaneous notifications and updates. Lastly, I would like to mention the live streaming of proceedings of the Chief Justice Court on YouTube, which we began on an experimental basis on 26th October 2020, which eventually turned out to be a huge success. In July 2021, all the courts of the Gujarat High Court went live. I feel proud to mention that the High Court of Gujarat has continued with live streaming of court proceedings, even after switching to physical functioning of the court. Undeniably, we face a host of challenges along the path, but the constant assistance of the information technology cell and commitment to realize the open court concept helped us to make these changes possible. Speaking of challenges, I would like to highlight that even though in 2019, India was the second largest online market in the world, at the same time, the internet penetration in the country was just under 50%, thereby leaving a large population of the country yet to receive the benefits of technological advancements. The advancement of information technology has brought people to a new dimension in life, both in positive as well as negative sense. This advancement has given a new dimension in the world of crimes. These cyber crimes can be against an individual, property, or nation state. To address these issues, Information Technology Act was incorporated in the year 2000. Additionally, as everything becomes digital, along comes the issue of digital profiling, because all data tends to leave a digital trace in today's world. It becomes all the more crucial to have a data protection law in place, which brings me to the next segment of today's session. Data privacy. In the landmark judgment of K.S. Puttaswamy, delivered in 2019, the nine judge bench of the Supreme Court unanimously recognized the right to privacy as an intrinsic part of the right to life and person liberty under Article 21. The judgment explained privacy in nine forms, one of it being informational privacy, which reflects an interest in preventing information about the self from being disseminated and controlling the extent of access to information. The judgment in Puttaswamy recognizes the right to privacy against not just the state, but private parties as well. The judgment gave the Indian government an opportunity to rethink its data protection mechanism, both in light of individual privacy and the interests of the state. The court had recommended that the government should examine and put in place a robust mechanism for data protection. This exercise is a precarious one as it would require a fair balancing of the rights of citizens as well as the state. With regard to data protection law in India, a committee headed by retired Supreme Court Judge Honorable Justice B. N. Sri Krishna was constituted by the government in July 2017 to deliberate on a data protection framework. The committee submitted its report and draft bill to the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology in 2018 July. The report emphasized that the interests of the citizens and the responsibilities of the state have to be protected, but not at the cost of trade and industry. The committee has also proposed a draft personal data protection bill. This bill was introduced in Lok Sabha in December 19. It was later referred to a joint parliamentary committee, which tabled its report in the Lok Sabha in December 21. The government withdrew the bill as it had many loopholes and said that the Joint Parliamentary Committee had recommended 81 amendments to it. The Personal Data Protection Bill was ingrained heavily in the idea of free, explicit and informed consent of the individual. It foresaw the formation of a data protection authority for its enforcement, placed heavy fiduciary duties on data controllers and processors and would have applied to a wide range of actors and stakeholders across various sectors. I would briefly point out some of the key terms which were introduced in the draft bill. Consent. This laid down that consent must be treated as a precondition for processing personal data. Consent should be informed or meaningful. Sensitive personal information should require the explicit consent of the individual. Second, sensitive personal data, which included passwords, financial data, health data, 
official identifier, sex life, sexual orientation, biometric, and genetic data, and data that reveals transgender, transgender status, intersex status, caste, tribe, religious or political beliefs, or affiliations of an individual, obligations of the data fiduciary. The bill set out the obligations of the entity that has access to the personal data. These included implementation of policies with regard to the processing of data, maintaining transparency with regard to its practices on processing data, implementing safe security safeguards such as encryption of data, and instituting deviance to redressal mechanisms to address complaints of individuals. I believe we must aspire to have a progressive and comprehensive legal framework for data protection since with the advent of technology, emerging, emerging issues are on the rise and will hopefully be appropriately addressed by the said law. The last section of my address, artificial intelligence in law. Clients looking for an attorney for a particular case falling into specific subcategories can use artificial intelligence based assistance to find themselves the best particular attorney based on the financial viability they have. Crucial factors of local demographic, for example, which judge can provide the best judgment can be detected by probability based statistics based on which attorneys have appeared the most or have performed well in front of a particular judge based on prior history. It is more likely that the artificial intelligence will be able to pass through all the legal evidence at hand and also simultaneously factor in the law to provide an estimate of what are the chances of the upcoming decision from the jury. In no way should the aforesaid statement be taken as that it is going to be a pre-imposed partiality, but rather viewed as that the best people get aligned with the particular objective of solving a case in the best possible way. In this way, the clients will be served much better in the future, all thanks to the digital development of artificial intelligence. With the opposite legal professionals need not be afraid that their work will be lost. The decisions, factors, estimates coming from the artificial intelligence will always only be estimates and the per se human factor can never be taken out of the legal equation. I look forward to the upcoming future of artificial intelligence in law, not as a way that it will close many doors, but it will open so many others. The open doors will only be visible to the explorers, adventurers, or simply put, the ones who go out to look for it. In my conclusion, I would only like to add, furthering the sea technology and its legal regulations are often seen from the lens of a great legal divide. The overwhelming stipulations installed in the technological advancements harbor concepts that seem rather nuanced to be adjusted in the systematic systemic and somewhat idealistic world of lawyers. It is obvious for the researchers and the legal fraternity to adopt a new social contract in the welfare state that will try to regulate the unprecedented technological change that has shown signs of transgressing human intelligence. It is the prerogative of the nation states and their entire forces, including the individuals seated here, that the rule of law must naturalize alongside the scientific paradigm in furtherance of human thought and society at large. Each new effort might present difficulties of its own, but it is my firm belief that the commitment to make the administrative and judicial system and overall governance more transparent and accessible by continuous effort shall overcome all such difficulties. Thank you for listening Thank to you. me patiently. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Honorable Justice Nash, for giving a very broad overview on four different subtopics of legal real that concerns um, not only space scientists and technologists, but also common citizens. Uh, this was a very insightful and informative talk, uh, especially uh, the information on establishment of virtual courts, its achievements, uh, the challenges that you faced and also the future in, in initiatives. I'm sure there are some questions from our uh, WebEx panel. 
And so to conduct the question and answer session, I would like to now invite Professor Pallam Raju, um, please. <clears throat> thank you, Professor Nandita. And uh, thank you, uh, Justice uh, Vikram Nadji, for this wonderful, uh, illuminating, uh, and informative talk, uh, uh, telling us of various uh, you know, uh, laws that are there uh, and several topics that you have touched. And, uh, and, and it's really, uh, uh, I'm sure that there would be, uh, you know, a lot of uh, interesting questions and clarifications, uh, uh, which, which, which uh, we, we, uh, uh, we were there by the, both the panel members here uh, in the WebEx. And also there are several, uh, 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 the audience in, in the YouTube also. So they'll be writing their questions and posting in chat. So I'll read out, uh, read them out for you here. So first, I will uh, invite uh, questions from the WebEx uh, panel. If uh, someone has raised hand, yes, uh, Anil Bharadwaj. I think I see your hand raised. Please go ahead. Thank you, Pallam, and thank you, Justice uh, Vikram Nath, for a very, in fact, introducing a new kind of uh, thought process in the scientific community. And particularly, I was, uh, uh, you know, quite uh, overwhelmed by listening that uh, artificial intelligence in law. You know, you are never thinking about that. Law will also be bringing this uh, AI and yes. ML into the picture. So that was a quite uh, new to me also. We never thought that law will also embrace that. Uh, I was just looking at uh, certain. Um, uh, slides where you mentioned about uh, you know the pollutions uh, part and the fines which are in you know charged for like water pollution or air uh, atmosphere pollution and things yes, like yes. that and uh, the amount which is quoted there is uh, somewhere around few hundred uh, rupees kind of you know that's right so don't you think that these are uh, they are peanuts compared to you know the uh, right. Uh, about the amendments may not have come up. The parliament will consider enhancing all these fines and everything. But now uh, this uh, national green tribunal, which is there under the NGT Act, hmm. it is taking up a lot of uh, pollution matters of big stakeholders. Hmm. IPC takes care of you know individuals committing some offence and you know troubling your neighbour or somebody. So the fines are like you. You're right. They are pity of uh, fines, two hundred rupees, five hundred rupees for every offence. But the NGT takes care of these larger stakeholders who are, uh, you know, polluting water and atmosphere and everything. And they have to pay. The polluters pay like fines into crores and thousands of crores and whatever it is. Parliament will consider some time how to go about it. You know, I I just uh, shared with you like when I was there this COVID period. This mask, not wearing a mask, uh, entailed a fine under mm -hmm. the you know notifications issued from the government. So the government had initially fixed a fine of two hundred rupees, and then or hundred rupees something like that. But people were ready and willing to pay hundred rupees, but not wear masks. So on the mm -hmm. judicial side, we took cognizance and we said no, the fine would be two thousand rupees. Then the government requested no, no, reduce it not two thousand. So we fixed it one thousand rupees. Mm -hmm. That also brought a kind of a check. So you're right, the fines should be increased and uh, the government, the parliament will consider it that sometime. Okay, thank you. I just yes. also wanted to yes. um, discuss something about, you know, this pollution, which is uh, now coming up in Delhi, you know, that Pareli oh, yes. burning yes. and things like that, ah. which is a part of the atmosphere pollution or air pollution, I should say. Yes, yes. yes. And uh, every year we are having and court passes many of this, uh, ah. you know. So much of time the court is consumed uh, in you know management of pollution, right. air, the air quality index all over the you know in all big cities that is a big problem. Right, so right. Start shifting to you know uh, rural areas or the outskirts and you know smaller cities right. where the right. level is much less. Right. So what and I was looking Delhi for is the pollution. Right. Yes. What I was looking for is that uh, can court take a cognizance of uh, this every year? Uh, you know, pollution which is coming up, uh, which chokes the Delhi like anything, not only Delhi, but all neighboring regions. 
and uh, it should direct uh, both the state and the central government to take uh, some steps uh, because this is a regular affair for last uh, several de decades i should say dr bharadwaj uh, i think uh, there are already directions in place for the last few years this is a regular routine uh, you know mm. matter of consideration by the supreme court and high courts in lucknow also i have taken up this issue uh, regarding pollution when i was there as senior judge so the directions are there the government has policy in place but its implementation and the people not complying with the directions of the state like stubble burning is a major reason for you know pollution in delhi right that stubble is created every year and that is to be destroyed and uh, somehow disposed of so the easiest way for the farmer is to burn it the moment it is burned a lot of smoke comes up and winter time it all you know doesn't go up it stays close to the earth so i think the directions are there and this year again i am sure the supreme court will take up or the high court will take up these issues again and you know continue issuing directions calling upon the chief secretary or the environment secretary to come up and you know explain what are you doing what are the steps taken then diesel and petrol for one reason now diesel is kind of banned diesel vehicles and they have to comply with those uh, you know green ab 1234 what is that called uh, variants the the the, the petrols uh... petrol ha ha there, there is a word na uh, yes ah uh, bharat stage 1234 bs uh, yes, stage so that keeps coming every time let's see <laughs> just my last question to you yes uh, you talked about uh, you know the video conferencing and you actually initiated that and, yes. and made it uh, uh, during particular the covid period of uh, yes. video conferencing gujarat high court and then it has become a, a routine thing now but do you think that we can have e courts also like we work have, from home situation yes yes we already have started e courts there are e courts where e courts like the no i am talking about supreme court part supreme court is also like uh, doing virtual work what do you so, mean matlab like, e court has number you know the variety of uh, forms one is a paperless e court where we have all the records on the laptop or on the screen or in a soft form whatever gadget we are using i use my laptop for all my files so i don't use any paper files with me paper files are there but everything is there on my laptop on the soft form and all matters i can scan through as they are called up and i can make my brief notes also on that then the other is the law is operating through virtual court virtual mode that is also permitted and once we go live then all the litigants sitting at home can watch the proceedings all the other side lawyers and other young lawyers the students can watch proceedings we used to get so much of good remarks on this youtube functioning from gujarat especially from students and young lawyers that is a great learning experience for us watching these proceedings so e courts if you mean this then it is already there in place and it's gradually coming up and lucknow we had two e courts where everything was there on the screen only and lawyers could appear with through their laptops i see okay good i think I, we are we are not very much aware about it that it has gone to that extent ah, the legal fraternity has the judicial system has uh, taken up technology in a very big way we are digitizing all the records very soon like all physical records will be destroyed and everything will be in a digital form huge exercise right. is going on yes and the government exactly. is giving us a lot of support for that we are getting funds everywhere and uh, all judicial officers everyone is using laptops and this uh, all orders are uploaded on website immediately they are transferred to nj dg and the party can access and any order of district court also sitting on it you can have a, today i have passed an order it is uploaded you can immediately get it world over it's there everything is on the public domain yes good great thank you must, thank you, you so much because budget sometime the high court or the supreme court then i yeah. show you <laughs> Your technology, yeah. which you developed, we are using it. Actually, scientists are afraid of going to court. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, I, I agree. Even I don't advise anyone to come to court. 
but i want to come to ask you to come to court to visit it you know as a guest huh. no, yeah, maybe e e court i will visit yeah e court be better yes thank you thank you okay okay uh, the, thank you next in uh, line is i think mr hemal shah uh, sir good evening i am from purchase department uh we import uh, equipments and consumables from all around the world and uh, sometimes it happens that foreign suppliers do not agree or accept the indian law they say this contract shall be governed by the israel law or german law or the france law and at mm -hmm. the time then uh, we find ourselves in a condition that what to do in this such situations so mm -hmm. can you suggest some remedies for such situations how can we handle it sir that is not my domain i will not be able to give you an answer for this that is up to you you are entering into a contract you negotiate with your uh, supplier okay that's two parties contracting so okay whatever uh, terms and conditions you are able to best to your uh, you know convenience you must uh, try and enforce sir is there any link between the applicable law and the settlement of disputes ke how the dispute will be settled uh, yes sir, there are laws in place the arbitration laws are there international laws contracts are there depends on what is the term of your agreement okay the, the no. place of litigation will the seat of litigation will be which place even in within the country also supposing you are in hyderabad and somebody is in delhi both of you enter into a contract of purchase and supply the supplier says the seat of litigation in case of any dispute would be delhi if the supplier is from delhi and you are the purchaser from hyderabad you say no the seat of litigation will be to hyderabad so both of you will have to decide on a common this thing in okay. case of a dispute this place would be the seat of litigation sir can we have a situation like uh, we accept the foreign law but the settlement of disputes will be according to say the international chamber of commerce or something like that is it Maybe possible i i i am not uh, aware of uh, all these uh, international covenants whatever we there you will have to okay. check up maybe you can you know hire some lawyer who will advise you on this somebody dealing with commercial matters okay 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 okay, okay. Uh, thank you we'll now move on to next uh, you know person dr neeraj rastogi okay hello sir so first of all thank you so much for the nice talk and this is the first time i got the opportunity to uh, virtually meet uh, judge and that also supreme court judge i never interacted with any judge i don't want to actually <laughs> court. okay sir uh, i have two questions one is related to your talk you were talking about the space law see means usually space debris doesn't fall on the earth but sometime it does fall so if it is falling and damaging somebody's property or killing someone in that case who will be responsible so that is what is uh, i was talking about all these laws need to be in place this some so at present means if something is happening um nobody is responsible for that no, but present. if it is identified that whose debris is that then he should be held responsible supposing your satellite or your uh, you know product or whatever it is in this space falls in another uh, country or somewhere and causes damage to life and property then you should be held responsible so there are laws for that ki if our satellite is falling some laws coming up for that there is a lot of debate is going on okay. and very soon we will have laws on that point okay and another question that is yes. as a common citizen if you allow me then i will ask you ask sir, me if i have an answer i will tell you if i don't have an answer i'll say okay. sorry okay okay so so we we have same constitution but when yes. things are at lower court then it is coming to high court or supreme court we see the verdicts are changing using the same constitution and many times in high court or supreme court if there are there is a bench there are multiple judges so three judges have different opinion one or two has different opinion so using the same constitution if we are having different opinion so that means it is the luck of petitioner that suppose if the judge is single so it is my luck that whom my uh, case is going to it is not actually means constitution but by luck also so is there any way means that can be minimized that okay this is the law so accordingly it has to be happened it should not vary from just to just uh generally it doesn't happen if these same set of facts are applied to, and law is applied to the same set of facts 
you will get the same answer from most of the judges, everyone. But depending upon, you know, slight different in facts, the application of law may change. You may think that it is the same, but for a judge deciding the matter, if the facts are not identical, then law can be applied differently. Or maybe in the same way, if it is, you know, a slight difference, then it does not really uh, change the uh, flavor of the case, right? No, but in as the French, French, the French, French all evidences are same. When when something is going to a bench, then all yes. the evidences, everything is same to all the judges. But different judges have different opinion. Uh, that is the you know the um, fun of this profession <laughs> that every judge thinks differently and may apply law to the same set of facts differently. But once it is settled, then the law is followed. That is why the Supreme Court laws is followed all over the country by all the subordinate courts, high courts, everybody. High court law laid down is followed by the district courts and the high courts of equal benches constitution, right? That's how it goes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll now uh, move to the next uh, person is Dr. B.K. Sahu. Vijaya. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is B.J. Sahu. Uh, yes. Thank you, you know, for making us aware about many, uh, you know, small, small laws, which I was not actually aware of. Uh, I just wanted to know, so, uh, there are many advanced technologies are available, uh, you know, with us now. So how it is decided that which technologies, you know, you can use for your uh, kind of systems or like that. So there, like there are also many other, like, for example, if you consider AI, there are different kind of, kinds of uh, artificial intelligence you know these things are there so who decides uh, you know that uh, which uh, what kind of ai will be useful or this kind of things in your system we also have a committees for that there is a committee of judges and then there are experts who are you know consulted and then based on their advice or uh, we sometimes refer matters to these expert institutes iits or uh, maybe national institute of technologies to get their opinions as to what is best for us and then we accordingly use it because we are not experts yeah so that is why i was just let me yes. we take your help for that we take your help scientists help yes yes okay that's okay uh dr harish gadvi uh, hello sir first of all yes. uh, thank you very much for very informative talk and particularly the development regarding this privacy related laws this was very hard working and in this domain and uh, technology and legal overlap domain, there is one thing called civil, civil score that uh, financial institute use. Uh, uh, it is being claimed, it's basically data science that uh, they try to make a score for an individual and according to financial institute charge the interest rate. But if you look at it as a whole process, it's very disempowering for the individuals. It's, it's, it's gives, it gives disproportionate powers to the financial institutes uh, uh, because it allows to sell even some individual inquiries with one financial institute. This information is shared with another financial institute without, and uh, if the individual says no, you don't sell, then they will not uh, even consider this application. So, in a way, it's in a highly disempowering kind of situation. So, they browbeat you that they will share your information, and uh, that yes. is the problem. You're right. Yeah, so, so, so what this is, is, now my, being I mean, taken is there care any development in this direction and how I mean, restrict the technology? I mean, this is a this is a case of technology disempowering the individuals. So, is there any development in this directions? I think if you raise an issue, somebody will uh, take up the case and uh, get it settled and decided. <laughs> <laughs> like I remember on the based on the CV score that the banks make uh, while uh, issuing credit cards earlier, twenty years back, I'm talking when these credit cards came. They yeah. would not issue credit cards to lawyers. <laughs> yeah, I think the situation is still same in smaller income. cities. <laughs> in smaller cities, they don't give. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there is uh, one question in the chat box. Uh, now, Dr. R. K. Mishra is asking, how do we protect uh, wildlife through law and justice? How do you put it? Courts are taking so much of interest in protection of wildlife and, uh, you know, flora and fauna of the country. So many public and spirited persons come to court for all this. And then there is National Green Tribunal, which also takes care of a lot of 
you know, for uh, forests and everything. And and then there is a follow-up question by him. This is yes. what is the hate speech and how do we define hate speech that some speech you know violates the law? How can we know? Any speech which creates some kind of hate inside you, which, which generates hate inside you against somebody, is a hate speech. Okay. And yeah. that is not now an offense. That is a punishable offense. Yeah. There's so many so, political leaders who are facing uh, trials of hate speech. The yeah. FIRs are lodged, and uh, apart from political leaders, there are individuals also who you know speak and maybe not they are political persons, but still as leaders of community or somebody. It happens. Okay. Offense. Anything which you personally feel you know will generate some kind of hate against another community or an individual is a hate. Yes. And he's asking, you know, is there a separate bench of Supreme Court for zone-wise separate benches? No, there's no zone-wise separate. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and I don't see any questions here in chat box. I have a couple, if you have a couple of minutes of time. Okay. Oh, yes. Yes. I have, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, related to a couple of uh, topics that you talked about in terms of environment. Uh, I was... Uh, when when there is a disorderly behavior of you know public uh, you know dharnas and all then they burn you know property buses and all so that also causes environmental uh, thing so are there uh, you know, environmental uh, laws you know slapped on the on the perpetrators like 268 I don't believe so because they are much bigger offenses than the, yeah, sure, yeah. Sure. so they are slapped all those serious uh, charges yeah. And uh, yes, they could be charged for the environmental uh, yes. violation yes. also. Right, because I was when I read this thing, this these laws are not you know read in the seen the papers. So I thought uh -huh. that this, if they are slapped, then probably they are they it will become more what do you say uh, awareness to general public also that yes. you know in addition to the bigger mistake and errors, this this is also you are doing. So that yes. was what. I was yes. Yeah, another uh, thing I had, another question I had was regarding the right of data privacy and all. And uh, uh, in nowadays, all the apps or all the softwares that we use, it's either zero or one. Either you accept the conditions or no. If you don't accept, you can't use it. Okay. So uh, there we could be a possibility that you know, I may agree with the n number of things, but a couple of things I may not be able to agree. So will yeah. there be, could there be, you know, laws to say that and still i should be able to use the software i may not agree with a couple of provisions but if these kind of problems come to court we will have to sort it out as of now so i have no such uh, yeah. knowledge of any such matter being you know decided by the court key you may insist on you know acceptance of four out of ten or six out of ten and not agree with the remaining four conditions right huh? Yeah, maybe there could be some major things that you must agree kind of things, but there should be some optional things, which if you don't agree, also still I should be able to use the software or the application. But right now, that's not See, there. The product owner says, hey, I, these are my conditions, you want it, you take it, otherwise, thank you. What can, how can you insist using that software if he says, these are my conditions, you don't want to... Yeah. I don't know, mother. somebody challenges it, we'll decide it in an appropriate forum. <laughs> right, because right now there's nothing, either it's zero or one, either yes. you accept or don't accept, that's it, <laughs> yeah. Do you challenge uh, it, you take up this cause and uh, you'll decide it something? Okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, are there uh, any more questions on the uh, WebEx panel, any panel who are members who are here? If not, um, if not, I should, you know, uh, you know, on behalf of PRL, I should, you know, thank you for the taking up a lot of questions. And all uh, so many, you know, wide topics you had talked about. Uh, I just uh, uh, would now to formally conclude. I will now, you know, uh, request my colleague, Dr. Bhushit Vaishnav, uh, to formally end the uh, proceeding. Dr. Bhushit, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Palam Raju. Uh, well, uh, all our listeners will agree uh, that all of us are enlightened with new knowledge today on uh, various laws which probably some of uh, many of us were not aware of uh, including starting from space law to uh, data privacy and uh, use of artificial intelligence in the law uh, thank you uh, honorable justice vikram nath ji for uh, sparing your very valuable time with us giving your precious evening and uh, you know having this session uh, with prl on our request 
uh, thank you to your office for uh, all the coordination that you have done uh, with PRL. Uh, I thank our director and dean for all their uh, encouragement and support all through this Vakyan series. Thanks to all the Vakyan committee members for their support. Thanks to our Webex as well as YouTube listeners for uh, being there on all Wednesdays to join us with this Vakyan series. Uh, the Vakyan series will still continue. Please be with us every week and we are going to have more interesting talks. Uh, with this, we conclude uh, today's session. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.